topic of the day, which in many ways is both novel, hot, controversial, however you want to describe it. Um, Imran is this. I don't know anyone who knows more about this field than Imran, and he's been immersed in it now for two to three years, and he's doing his um, thesis on this. Uh, and you know when someone's really lost in their work, when they're phoning you up at night at 10 o'clock to tell you about a paper they've just read. And I think with that, I'll leave you, Imran. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Um, I, I work at the Haramshah Hospital. I'll be uh, talking to you about CDAC disease, but also introducing you to this newly defined clinical concept known as non cedar gluten sensitivity and the uh, controversies that it brings. So we had to move forward here. There we go. So we'll, we'll start by setting the scene, and that's by discussing CDAC disease. So CDAC disease is defined as a state of heightened immune response to ingested gluten genetically susceptible, susceptible individuals. So what that basically means is that your patient with CDAC disease consumes gluten-based products, and that stimulates a reaction in the small bowel, and you can detect this serologically by the presence of endomycin antibodies and tissue transglutaminase antibodies, and also by doing, performing duodenal biopsies, which histologically show loss of the villi, so you get villus atrophy. Once your patient is diagnosed with celiac disease, you commence them on a strict lifelong gluten-free diet. So when the first prevalence report on celiac disease came out in the 1950s, it was felt to be a rare condition isolated to children who presented with symptoms of weight loss, uh, failure to thrive and steatorrhea, which is pale, foul smelling stools. But if you look at contemporary studies, they suggest that celiac disease is actually quite common. It affects around 1 in 100, and that's been shown in studies done in the, uh, in the UK, studies done in the United States, uh, which was 0.7%, uh, and also studies replicated around the world. So celiac disease is a worldwide condition and it's a global phenomenon. So you may ask yourself, why has a condition gone from being rare? to very common. Well, there are a number of possible reasons. Firstly, our understanding of celiac disease has changed. No longer is it a condition isolated to children. Uh, in fact, uh, the majority of cases are in adults who present between <coughs> the fourth to the sixth decade. And it's also no, no longer about the classical presentation of um, diarrhea and weight loss. Most patients present with non-classical symptoms such as anemia or irritable bowel. And as clinicians, we are more vigilant for celiac disease and we look out for it and we test for it. And the tests that we have have, have improved. So uh, initially in the 1980s, we had anti antibodies. And on the whole, these have generally been superseded by endomycin antibodies and tissue transglutaminase antibodies. The third reason is endoscopy. For me, having been in gastroenterology for a few years, endoscopy seems like it's been around forever, but actually it's quite a novel technique, uh, which has been around for 30, uh, 30 to 40 years. And upper GI endoscopy in particular can be performed with relative ease, and you do not perhaps it's taken with simplicity. And then finally, this is a painting by Van Gogh, just to remind me that as society we consume a large amount of gluten-based products, but this wasn't always the case. See, mankind has been around for 2.5 million years, but wheat was introduced into our diet uh, when it was first cultivated in the Fertile Crescent around 10,000 years ago. And currently wheat is being produced globally and it's been consumed in large quantities and we've also been exposed to different concentrations of wheat <coughs> and forms. So, going back to the start, if celiac disease affects 1% of the population, you would intuitively expect that 1% of thereabouts are consuming a gluten-free diet. But reports, and these are mainly from the media, uh, over the last few years have suggested that a gluten-free diet is now big business, it's growing in popularity, because in some quarters gluten is seen as a dietary villain. Um, and the chart on your left shows the, the rise in gluten-free products over time. Uh, and this is just a, an app which shows that many fast food chains and franchises provide gluten-free products, which certainly wasn't the case a decade ago. But this is all speculative media data. Is there anything more scientific and robust? Well, in the last few years, we've had a couple of studies. The, the top one was from New Zealand, and this looked at children and found that 5% of kids are avoiding gluten, yet 1% of celiac disease. And then the study below is from the United States, and this found that, put, oh, sorry, uh, this found that 63% of the US population are consuming a gluten-free diet the majority unaware that they have celiac disease. So the, the common theme is that they are patients, sorry, they are individuals taking a gluten-free diet outside uh, celiac disease. 
but is this for health reasons or is it hype? Uh, certainly nowadays, it seems that society is heavily influenced by celebrities and what they wear or what they eat. And this could be, just be a current fashion trend which will slowly die away until the next so-called fashion statement comes along. But I'd like, you to, I'd like to go back to some of the literature. This has actually been a problem for many decades. And I came across this fantastic case report, which was published in The Lancet back in 1978 by Drs. Ellis and Lineker. And I'd, I'd like to go through this slowly and give you the opportunity to read this. And I've highlighted the main points uh, within the boxes. So this is a 43-year-old woman who presents with a four-month history of colicky lower abdominal discomfort, <coughs> bloating, and diarrhea. Her appetite and weight are, are stable. Um, the, the physicians uh, investigated in extensively by the means of blood tests, uh, stool samples, x-rays, uh, bearing, bearing meals, and she also undergoes uh, endoscopy, and her biopsies from the small bowel are normal. Now, they've not written this letter what the diagnosis they gave to this lady at the time, but certainly in today's day and age, we would probably call this irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, as, as, as they were unable to find a cause, uh, unfortunately her symptoms continued for a further two years until she tried a gluten-free diet and remarkably within four days her symptoms resolved. So the clinicians reinvestigated her for the possibility of celiac disease which involved going on a gluten challenge and this provoked uh, her abdominal uh, symptoms but there was no evidence of celiac disease. And I'd just like to pay attention to the title, the, the, the title of this letter called it non celiac gluten sensitivity and this is something that came to life 30 years later and is now embedded within the spectrum of gluten related disorders. <coughs> so you can see nothing's really changed. The patient from 30 years ago is very similar to the patient today. I'm flying away. Okay, so a lot of these symptoms are consistent with irritable bowel syndrome and irritable bowel syndrome is very common, it affects around 5-15% to of the population and there's many potential triggers of uh, IBS, for example, family history, stre uh, genetic stress, it can occur after severe bout of gastroenteritis, but diet is felt to be one of the most common triggers affecting around two thirds of patients and if you ask individual uh, patients what symptoms, uh, sorry, what diet triggers their symptoms, most commonly they this, the report wheat, but this is all subjective and it's self-reported. The only way to confirm it would be by undergoing an elimination diet followed by blinded re-challenges, which in clinical practice is, is quite is, well, it's difficult to do. But Professor Caraceo from Italy has, has done this and I'd like to uh, walk you through this study um, carefully. So he identified 920 patients with irritable bowel syndrome and they did not have celiac disease. And then they went on a four-week elimination diet. And the elimination diet included uh, wheat, I'm trying to remember this, cow's milk, eggs, tomatoes, and unfortunately, chocolates too. Um, and then the patients were blinded to receiving capsules. And the capsules were either placebo or wheat capsules. And a third responded to the wheat capsules and became symptomatic. And as shown by the green line, they had worsening overall symptoms, worsening abdominal bloating, worsening pain and worsening stool dissatisfaction. So what this shows is that in the absence of celiac disease, wheat can indeed induce gastrointestinal symptoms. The group from Australia, which is Professor Gibson's group, have dug deeper, dug deeper and found that gluten per se can also induce gastrointestinal symptoms in the absence of celiac disease. And I'll try to go through this one carefully as well. So they, this was a newspaper uh, advertisement asking for patients with gluten sensitivity to come forward. So they had around 100 cases. Many of them were excluded on the basis that they had celiac disease or they were not willing to participate or they were still symptomatic. So they were left with 39 individuals who had gluten sensitivity, were very well on a gluten-free diet and did not have any evidence of celiac disease. And this was a well, still a well-powered study. And then the investigators intervened with snacks and the snacks were in the form of muffins. Uh, and one lot of muffins were gluten-containing muffins, and the other lot of muffins were gluten-free muffins. And it's important to say that these muffins were the same in taste, were the same in texture, but they were also free of any conflicting substrates. And by that, I mean uh, fructans, which, which are part of the FODMAP group, and I'll touch on that later. So this was pure gluten or no gluten. Uh, and, this, and, the, and the participants were blinded, um, and, and the group given gluten deteriorated. <coughs> 
And as you can see, this by the red line, they had worsening overall symptoms compared to placebo, worsening pain, <coughs> worsening bloating, worsening stool dissatisfaction, increasing fatigue, and uh, flatulence as well. So both studies have shown that in the absence of celiac disease, wheat and gluten itself can induce gastrointestinal symptoms. Subsequently, this led to a uh, revision uh, of the criteria of gluten-related disorders. Now we have three arms. We have celiac disease, which as I said at the start is a positive serology and uh, villus atrium duodenal biopsies. Uh, we have wheat allergy. I apologise, I've not discussed wheat allergy because this is something predominantly seen in the paediatric uh, cohort. And these are kids who present with urticaria, uh, wheels and angioedema. And you can test for wheat allergy by IgE, uh, wheat serology or skin prick test. And then finally, this third arm, this new arm, called non celiac gluten sensitivity, which takes you back to that letter written 30 years ago. So what do we know about non celiac gluten sensitivity compared to celiac disease? Well, the immune response seems to be different. And I'll, I'll, this, I'll go, there's the innate immune response and the adaptive immune response. And if we just focus on this, uh, this uh, box here, we have DC, which is uh, direct controls, CD, which is celiac disease, and GS, which is non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And this is for the gluten exposure. You can see there's no response in direct controls, but there is a response in celiac disease and gluten sensitivity. And then there's also an adaptive immune response, which is a follow-on response, which does not occur in direct controls, which does not occur in, celiac, uh, in gluten sensitivity, but it does occur in celiac disease. So what this suggests is that in celiac disease, you have the full-blown reaction to gluten. You have the innate immune response followed by the adaptive immune response, so the whole place burns down. Whereas in non-celiac gluten sensitivity, it's half-hearted. You have the innate immune response, but you don't progress to the adaptive immune response. It's a bit like kicking the door but not being able to break in. What about serology in non-celiac gluten sensitivity? Well, this is where, unfortunately, we, we have difficulty as there are no biomarkers. In celiac disease, as mentioned, you have positive endomycelial antibodies and positive tissue transglutaminase antibodies, as seen here, whereas in non-celiac gluten sensitivity, it's negative. Oops. Uh, anti glandular antibodies are seen in celiac disease, as expected. There's some promising reports that they can be seen in non-celiac gluten sensitivity, but it's only in around 50% of cases, but 50% are negative, so it can't be used as a biomarker. But there is some reports that it might be used as a, as a, a follow to see if they are adhering to a gluten-free diet. So now I'd like to take you on to a study that we've recently uh, uh, published. This is just a snapshot of the abstract that you can read at a later date, but I'll go through the study in detail now. So this was a, a, a study performed in Sheffield assessing for the population prevalence of self-reported gluten sensitivity and what the diagnostic yield is in secondary care. So there were three main aims of, of this uh, study. Firstly, to assess the population prevalence of self-reported gluten sensitivity. Secondly, to determine the diagnostic care in secondary care. And thirdly, to see is there any difference between this group with non-celiac gluten sensitivity against celiac disease. So the population study um, uh, was an extensive questionnaire which comprised three sections. The first section was basic demographics, the second section was past medical history, and the third section was where the patients had self-reported uh, self symptoms of gluten sensitivity. And we interviewed a thousand individuals, mean age was 39, and there was 50-50 gender split. And around 13% complained of some sensitivity to uh, uh, gluten-based products. But interestingly, 3.7% were actively consuming a gluten-free diet, although 0.8% had a formal doctor diagnosis of celiac disease. So this is similar to the reports from the United States and New Zealand that in the UK, individuals are also taking a gluten-free diet outside celiac disease. And just to try and get a picture of who are these individuals, um, the characteristic phenotype was the predominantly women around the age, around the age of 40. Uh, there's a higher uh, association with anxiety, depression, chronic fatigue, and other food intolerances. Many of them fulfilled the Rome criteria for irritable bowel syndrome. And the reason why that is is because many attributed gluten to induce abdominal complaints. For example, bloating, discomfort, pain, constipation, diarrhea, and flatulence. Many also experienced extra, extra intestinal <coughs> symptoms such as fatigue and headaches and joint pains. We then went on to look at all the referrals in sec that we had in secondary care, specifically uh, by GPs, um, for patients referred with gluten-related gastrointestinal symptoms. 
uh, and we had 200 cases, and again, the majority were women around the age of 40, so very similar to the population group. And then we investigated these patients for the possibility of celiac disease by them undergoing a gluten challenge followed by duodenal biopsies on concurrent celiac serology. And we found that actually celiac disease only affects a minority, 7%. The majority have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. If you look at the HLA typing, which is a genotype associated with celiac disease, as expected, it was present in the celiac patients, but it's also seen in 50% of the non-celiac group. And this is higher than you would expect in the general population, of 20, which is 25%, suggesting that HLA may have some role, but incomplete, to play in the immunopathogenesis. And then finally, we compared the 93% diagnosed with non celiac gluten sensitivity against a large cohort of patients already under our care with cast iron celiac disease, and we compared their baseline <coughs> parameters. And the main findings were that, and not surprisingly, that the group with celiac disease were more likely to have anemia and nutritional deficiencies, so low levels of four, uh, iron, folate, B12, albumin. Uh, and they also had a mean body mass index which is two points lower than the non-celiac group. And this is to be expected because patients with celiac disease, as mentioned at the start, have villus atrophy, so they have a reduced absorptive area, whereas with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, the villi are normal. So where are we now? Well, currently, despite the, there's obviously a lot of excitement, but there's also a lot of confusion too, uh, and that's because of FODMAPs. Now, for those of I'm sure many of you will be aware, as, as it's predominantly dietitians, but FODMAPs are fermentable sugars. So these are found in many food products, and these are poorly, poorly absorbed by us, and instead they go into the colon where bacteria ferment them, and they produce gas, and that gives you bloating, and they produce short-chain fatty acids, which gives you diarrhea. Now, the FODMAP found in wheat is fructose, and that can also trigger abdominal symptoms in IBS. So it becomes very difficult when a patient says that they have sensitivity to gluten-based products to know whether it's gluten, whether it's fructans, there's actually another, uh, another kid on the block called amylase trypsin inhibitors, or whether they're all working synergistically uh, within wheat that's inducing their symptoms. And unfortunately, we do not have any biomarkers to delineate between the three. And I'd like to, uh, this is my penultimate slide of a follow-on study done by the group from Australia. Um, so this again was a newspaper uh, advertisement asking for patients with non-celiac gluten sensitivity who were very well controlled on their gluten-free diet to come forward. Uh, so a group of patients came forward, but in fact, looking at the data, many of them, almost half, were not very well controlled as they had a visual analog, visual analog score baseline between 20 to 60. And this is whilst on a gluten-free diet. And when the investigators intervened with a low FODMAP diet, there was a significant improvement. Now, the way I've translated this into my clinical practice is that if a patient presents to you with a partial response to a gluten-free diet, it, may be, it seems worthwhile extending it to a low FODMAP diet. But if you look at the patients that were well-controlled on a gluten-free diet, so let's say for argument's sake below a vast score of 20, trying to read between the lines, a low FODMAP diet didn't, doesn't seem to have much of a difference to them. The next step of the study was to see whether there was a dose-dependent effect of gluten given the previous positive findings. Uh, and so the, the, the groups were randomised to low-dose gluten, high-dose gluten, or whey protein, which was placebo. And this was, again, a blinded study, uh, and they were randomised. But in this study, it was a crossover design. So what I mean by that is patients receive one diet for a week, followed by a two-week washout period, followed by another diet for a week, two-week washout period, followed by the third diet. And in this study, there was no specific or dose-dependent effect to gluten. In fact, there was a nocebo response in that all three groups deteriorated. And w one possible explanation to, to that could be because of the crossover design. So patients knew that two of their three diets were going to contain gluten, and they may have had an anticipatory effect from the outset. So this is my final slide uh, to summarise. Uh, there, there has been an exponential rise in the use of a gluten-free diet. The gluten-related disorders include celiac disease, wheat allergy, and uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Uh, a di currently, we reach a diagnosis of non-celiac gluten sensitivity following exclusion of celiac disease and wheat allergy. Um, patients with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, sensitivity do not seem to have the complications associated with celiac disease that baseline. We don't know about the longitudinal uh, follow-up. Uh, 
Currently, we have no biomarkers to diagnose non cedar gluten sensitivity, and as a result, it's very difficult in clinical practice to inform a patient whether it's gluten or fructans or something else within which that's triggering their symptoms. And there has been some debate, and I do concur with this, that maybe we should be referring to these individuals as having non cedar wheat sensitivity instead, rather than non cedar gluten sensitivity. And last but not least, I'd like to thank, uh, thank CEDAC UK for giving me this opportunity, but also uh, the University of Sheffield, the Department of Gastroenterology, and the wonderful team that I work with. Thank you. And thank you. Professor Sikotero, we get a microphone to you. Hi, I enjoyed that very much. Uh, um, the management of irritable bowel syndrome has completely changed since the Melbourne study. Um, previously, you sent them to a dietitian. No one really knew what to do. I think the dietitians got very fed up because they didn't know what to advise. You now specifically ask for a diet omitting fermentable oligodiamonosaccharides with polyols, high in fibre and fluid. And in my experience, 85, there is an 85% improvement in their symptoms. You presented the data and we now know that 20% of the normal population in Australia is taking a gluten-free diet and we're moving towards that in the UK. My own view is that what, we're, what you're describing here is basically irritable bowel syndrome. You're writing a PhD on it and therefore you must have widespread looking at the references and things like that. Is your conclusion the same as mine or do you think there really is an organic disease here which is separate? It, given the fact that this minor dietary change, well, minor significant dietary change, has made a big difference, and I thought your last slide, where the placebo had exactly the same effect as the other things, was absolutely fascinating. I'd just be uh, interested in what you, the final paragraph of your PhD, what's it going to say? <laughs> I think at this moment in time, um, as mentioned, there is enough evidence there to say gluten does induce gastrointestinal symptoms in the absence of celiac disease. Uh, so this entity of non celiac gluten sensitive does exist. The question is, when you have a patient with irritable bowel syndrome, it, or present, uh, identify whether it's gluten or whether you need to extend to a low FODMAP diet. Now, there has been a recent publication suggesting that a low FODMAP diet is beneficial in irritable bowel syndrome. But it's, from what I understand, a low FODMAP diet is extremely extensive and restrictive for an individual. And it may be one option would be to, for individuals to try a gluten-free diet first with IBS. And if it only has a partial benefit, then to extend to a low FODMAP diet. Um, that would be my personal opinion. Uh, Professor Joe and then Professor Kennedy. Thanks. I, I was going to be very controversial because I think you've done a lot of harm by using the term glu non-celiac gluten sensitive um, uh, because I don't think there is any evidence to show that gluten, a prolamine, a protein, actually causes these symptoms. Now back in the 1980s, John Hunter in, in Cambridge started using exclusion diets with challenge for irritable bowel and we did a uh, rather more extensive study in Oxford and we found exactly the same foods that you showed in your slide with wheat coming up uh, right at the top and at the time we thought that it was resistant starch that were causing the problems uh, and uh, um, I'm actually uh, getting Peter to look at his low FODMAP diet and get his dietitians to work out how much <coughs> resistant starch there is there because I think that is a problem in taking out wheat. Um, re you remove the starch, which is resistant to small intestinal enzymes. It goes into the colon and gets fermented by the bacteria, and, and hence the distension, the wind, and the, and the loose stool. Um, so, I mean, it's obviously not just resistant starch, but it is found in many of the foods um, with, with high FODMAP content. Um, but things like sorbitol um, and the other polyols obviously play the role as well. But I really do not think there is any evidence to indicate prolamine as, as a cause of the symptoms. And, and therefore, your very last comment on the last slide, I would wholeheartedly agree with that we should talk about non-celiac wheat sensitivity um, or, or, or FODMAP sensitivity, if you like, but not um, non-celiac gluten sensitivity. <laughs>
I, I tend to agree with the non-celiac wheat sensitivity idea too, but I perhaps would extend it to non-IgE wheat allergy, non uh, celiac or whatever. But uh, I would like to tickle you a little bit by saying, do you think, rather than putting people on a low FODMAPS diet, there might be some people who need to be considered as bacterial overgrowth patients instead of just manipulating the diet? Uh, or what do you, have you made a practice of looking for bacterial overgrowth in any of these people? Um, for, for well, there is ev actual evidence now, which is from uh, Peter Green's group in New York, that some patients who have, rep well, who report sensitivity to wheat and gluten have been diagnosed as having bacterial overgrowth. So that's something that I've now started introducing into my practice. I mean, I think I, I agree with you. I think it's a, it's a controversial area for which we do not have all the answers. Um, I, I think that there are now a number of groups working on biomarkers or something else, so it's, it's work in progress. Um, and for me, if I was summarising it, I would say that for the first time in maybe two decades, nutritional therapies are back on the market for gastrointestinal symptoms because for a long time they have been in the wilderness uh, and the only person really was John Hunter at that time and so that uh, might be the message that I would take if I was writing the last paragraph Paul in that thesis that might be what I'd say which is uh, nutritional therapies are back and, and that might well be the, the thing that we'd say so if I could Jim thank you so thank much you. if I could draw this to a close